aware that we're on live stream today, aren't they? Yes. Give me some help. Right. My lords, my lady, uh, may it please you, I appear for the appellant, Mr. Salman, but in this matter, uh, with my learned friend, um, Ms. Zara al um instructed by Feynman's um, with uh, Ms. Chahal QC. Um, my learned friend, uh, Mr. Olga Sanders QC, appears for the respondent, Secretary of State, uh, with Ms. Amelia Walker. Um, my lords, my lady, um, a little bit of housekeeping. Apologies, as ever, in this situation for additional bundles of authorities. There is one further bundle which we've arranged to be placed <coughs> on your Lordship's bench, volume six, of which I will take your Lordships to, my lady, uh, as we get to them. Um, there also should have been a, a document that didn't make its way into the uh, supplementary bundle, uh, which had been before Mr. Justice Inglesby taken out by oversight, which I hope has now found its way into your Lordship's bundles uh, at section E. It's the document by the Open Society uh, Trust, which should be in your supplementary bundle, that's bundle uh, three, at uh, page E1100, because um, I will be taking your Lordship's to a few passages in that document, but I hope that it's in your bundles. If it's not, I've got some spare copies. We'll look at that later on. Um, it, it's also, there. Now, can I just it's mention there. from from our point of view a couple of um, housekeeping points? The first is, as you know, we're being live streamed. We don't see ourselves uh, any need or occasion for counsel or ourselves, for that matter, to refer to anything that is strictly confidential. Uh, if, however, uh, either uh, you or Mr. Sanders uh, are about to refer to something which is truly confidential and you need to do so, you will have to warn me because I will then have to stop the live streaming. But at the moment, we can't see that the questions of law that apply in this case require um, any reference to uh, matters of uh, sensitivity, security or confidential. That's the first point. The second point is that we have had the opportunity of reading extensively into this case, um, and um, having done so, we can see absolutely no reason why uh, the appellant, um, the appellant's case should not be completed in your opening by the end of today, and why the reply should not be, um, uh, by Mr. Sanders, should not be completed by, say, mid-afternoon uh, tomorrow, with the opportunity for, for you to do a short reply that point. That is our current, and we intend at the moment, certainly, to ask you, please, to abide by that timetable. Well, my lords, um, my lady, of course, um, with that uh, request, I will do my very best to comply. What Mr. Sanders and I had done was to discuss the timing. Uh, I had indicated that I would need a little bit of tomorrow morning, uh, but in view of your lordship's indication, um, I'm hoping uh, that that's not going to happen. 
I will certainly be able to review the position at lunchtime, but I, I'm confident that, that I can comply with that. Thank you. Now, so far as you, it concerns your application to admit further evidence is concerned, we do not wish to spend time at the outset this morning uh, to um, start the debate over that. We have read all that material. We do not need to be referred to it uh, in terms of looking at the individual documents. You can certainly summarise at an appropriate moment, I'll come to that, at an appropriate moment, why you rely upon it. So we don't want to be taken to it. We can we see what's in it. Uh, we can remind ourselves what's in it when we come to write our judgments. Uh, if you want to make any arguments in relation to the admissibility of that material, you can refer to it as well as in global terms for what you say it shows, of course. Uh, uh, and what we propose to do uh, is to wait until you come to uh, that part of your um, submissions where you wish to, as you were, refer to that material, uh, and um, we will then uh, hear your submissions on it. We are likely to make up our minds on its ad ad admissibility when we write our judgments. Well, no, no, uh, that's very helpful. Uh, that was what I was going to ask your Lordship. Thank you. Um, uh, my Lords, my Lady, by way of introduction, this is a case about the powers of the uh, state to counter extremism. Uh, more particularly, the extent to which those powers are regulated uh, and whether those laws comply with fundamental human rights. The appellant is a devout Orthodox Muslim who was named in a government press release in September 2015 as an <coughs> extremist hate speaker and an example of the kind of person who would not, uh, following the coming into force of the prevent duty, be able to come and speak in universities and other higher educational establishments because of the risk the government considered he would radicalise students. The source of this government assessment turned out to be a government organisation called the Extremism Analysis Unit, assisted by a private organisation known as Student Rights, um, <clears throat> who had, unbeknownst to the appellant, been monitoring his activities, uh, primarily online, um, and had formed the view that he was an extremist, a label which he vehemently denies. And as a consequence of the press release and the prevent duty guidance, the invitations that Mr. Butt previously received from universities to come and speak primarily to university Islamic societies have dried up. And he has suffered <coughs> abuse in the press and online. <coughs> Now, the appellant brought a defamation claim uh, in relation to the press release, um, which in fact has since been heard following uh, a preliminary ruling by Mr Justice Nicholl by this court, including one member of this constitution, my lady. Um, uh, and I understand that uh, judgment has been reserved in relation to that case. And the case before this court relates to two further distinct but related challenges. And I'm going to take these in reverse order to how they were developed below. And I'm going to be developing my submissions, my Lords, my Lady, in, uh, by reference to the submission set out in the outline submissions document that was uh, uh, served on the 29th of November. The first challenge is to the powers of the Extremism Analysis Unit to monitor, or as we would put it, to carry out surveillance of those individuals that it considers to be extremists, primarily but not exclusively from publicly available information online and to store and share that information with other public bodies. The overall issue is whether its activities in relation to Mr Butt infringed his convention right to respect for his private life under Article 8. But in resolving that question, we submit that the court will need to assess the overall compliance of the legal framework under which the extremism analysis unit operates. Now, this is an area where the law has been developing at a significant rate and takes into account uh, data protection law, Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, the data protection directive under EU law, uh, the general data protection regulation which came into force in May of this year, and of course, Article 7 and 8 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights <coughs> under the European uh, Union. Um, <clears throat> and there have been a number of challenges which uh, have some bearing on this matter, which I will be referring to, the Digital Rights Ireland case, the Watson case, uh, which was heard in the, was decided in the 
Court of Justice of the European Union following a reference by this court, and the very recent decision of the European Court of Human Rights in the Big Brother Watch case, all of which have looked at various aspects of the United Kingdom's uh, surveillance laws. Um, also of some relevance is the right to be forgotten litigation, um, deriving uh, both domestically and from uh, Strasbourg and the CG, CJEU. And there's a lot of relatively recent case law since the hearing below. Um, my, Lord's, my Lady, the second challenge <coughs> is to the legality of the prevent duty guidance um, as to when universities can or should prevent extremists from being invited onto university campuses to speak to students um, in the discharge of the university's prevent duty under section 26 of the Counterterrorism and Security Act 2015. And it's Mr. Butt's case that this guidance, and has it uh, is applied or potentially applied in his case, breaches his common law rights and his convention rights uh, to free speech, uh, to freedom, of pra freedom to practice his religion and freedom of assembly. Although, as you will be aware, we are developing the submissions primarily in relation to uh, Article 10, free speech. My Lord, my Lady, this guidance applies to 162 uh, educational establishments, further educational establishments in the country, who between them collectively educate 2.2 million students. Uh, the claims, uh, as your Lordships know, were dismissed in July 2016, but in granting permission to appeal, Lord Justice Bean indicated that both issues raised uh, issues of public importance, which is why we are here. My Lords, at the heart of both challenges lies the government's <coughs> definition of extremism. <coughs> now, that definition uh, you'll be taken to um, uh, uh, during the course of this hearing is as follows. It is the vocal or active opposition to fundamental British values, including democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect and tolerance of different faiths and beliefs. And it includes non-violent extremism as well as violent extremism. This definition was introduced in 2011, following a change in the government's counter-terrorism and counter-extremism policy um, to switch from a focus on violent extremism to include non-violent extremism. And my lords, I'm just going to give you some references. Uh, I won't take you to them. But the, um, our, our original skeleton argument, paragraphs 46 and following, uh, which is at page 142 of the core bundle, the prevent strategy itself of 2011, paragraphs 7.1 to 7.2, which is at Supplementary volume, bundle volume three, page E478. And the glossary, which contains the definition I just read out at page E543. Then there's the document known as Contest, the UK's strategy for countering terrorism from July 2011, paragraphs 5.19 and 5.22, which is at page E612 of volume three. And the Tackling Extremism document, again in volume three, beginning at page six, E677, at page E679, paragraphs 1.3 to 1.4. Now, my lords, this policy is not set out in any statute. <coughs> the closest statutory expression <coughs> of the counter extremism <coughs> policy is found in the Counterterrorism and Security Act 2015, in particular in Section 26, uh, which imposes a duty on public authorities to have due regard to the need to prevent people being drawn into terrorism. But the term extremism is not used in the 2015 Act. Uh, a much anticipated counter-extremism bill in 2015 never materialised. And the appellant submits in a nutshell that the definition of extremism that is used is overbroad and that the exercise of these governmental powers in a bid to counter extremism as defined goes <coughs> beyond what Parliament 
as authorised, breaches rights of privacy, and is likely to have a chilling effect on rights of free speech and religion and assembly. And in April 2016, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Speech, uh, having visited the United Kingdom and reviewed its laws, uh, issued a report uh, in which he expressed concern about the definition of extremism. And this is what he said. It is difficult to define the term non-violent extremism without treading into the territory of policing thought and opinion. Innocent individuals will be targeted. Many more will fear that they may be targeted, whether because of their skin colour, their religion, or their political persuasion, and will be fearful of expressing, of exercising their rights. Both outcomes are unacceptable. <coughs> and for your Lordship's note, that is uh, volume four of the authorities, tab 101, page 4154. Type that Four, tab 101, page 4154. And my lords, in those circumstances... Well, that, that, that encapsulates quite a lot of the evidence you rely upon from all sorts of different people. Absolutely. I mean, that's, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a broad way, you're saying that there's plenty of material there to say the definition of extremism is too vague and it has a chilling effect. And I will be able to move very quickly... We, we understand that. My Lord, in a nutshell, we submit that the laws that purport to authorise such interferences must be clear and unambiguous, and they must be accompanied by appropriate safeguards that are entrenched in the law. And it's our case in both cases <coughs> that the laws do not meet the standard required by the rule of law both the rule of law as it is articulated in common law, but more explicitly in the context of uh, the convention. So what, what is it that should be clear about is the policy? The, the law, the, the, any law that purports to authorise such interferences need to be clear and unambiguous, accompanied by appropriate safeguards, and entrenched in a, a document that has the quality of a law. And it's our case certainly in relation to the EAU, the Extremism Analysis Unit, the powers of the Extremism Analysis Unit do not meet that, uh, that standard, uh, as it is understood in concepts such as prescribed by law, in accordance with the law, and necessary in a democratic society. There's no challenge to the um, compliance of the, um, the Act of 2014. No, we, we accept that, that the, concept, the concept of preventing people being drawn into terrorism is one that is set out in the law. Uh, while it may be uh, <coughs> um, a difficult one to apply in practice, we, it's our case in relation to the prevent duty guidance that, putting to one side how difficult it might be to express and articulate the concept of terrorism, um, what the policy has in fact done is to go further uh, and to require universities uh, to take steps to prevent people being drawn into extremism, including non-violent extremism. And in that respect, <coughs> we would say it goes further than what is authorised by Section 26. Uh, I need to relate these rather general submissions, certainly um, concerning um, the EU. To, uh, the EAU, to your ground for appeal. Now, the EAU grounds are grounds four and five. Lord, yes. One is Article 8, and the other one is a particular one under RIPA. Yes. All right, just so we can. So when you, when you make these, I say that because when you make the broad statement, yes. we say that any law authorizing such interference is clear and unambiguous, accompanied by appropriate safeguards, this is an Article 8 point. It is. All right, just so that I can relate yes. it to the ground of appeal. It's an Article 8 point in relation to the EAU. Yes. We don't, we're not raising it under any other provision, no. of the common law, for example. Um, in relation to the free speech uh, issues, those do <coughs> draw on common law principles as well. Um, but what we say in relation to the EAU, and I'm going to deal with the EAU first, yes. 
is that the, the law which authorises the, uh, the, the carrying out of uh, surveillance is the common law. So what Mr Sanders relies upon is the common law, possibly prerogative powers of the police to, to investigate and, and of other public bodies to carry out investigations. We say, well, that doesn't cut the mustard for the purposes of secret surveillance, which is what we say this is. And secondly, we say that the documents which set out the detail of what the uh, EAU can and can't do do not have the quality of law uh, <coughs> because they were contained at the time in secret confidential uh, policies. That, um, I can't remember that particular point being addressed by the judge. That, uh, am I wrong about that? Milo, Milo what, what the judge did was he, he said, well, look, actually, there hasn't been an interference with Mr. Butt's Article 8 rights. So he wasn't going to look well, at... He said he wasn't... He, he said, he, I think he said uh, Article 8 wasn't engaged. That's the first It wasn't thing. engaged. So he didn't then go on to consider the broader point right. as to the compliance of the, the law with um, Article 8. So if you... If you well, what he said was he was, he was not going to look at the, how it applies in other cases. So what, we, uh, what we're what essentially dealing with is um, certain parts of these submissions, which were all made before the judge, um, were wrapped up in his decision that there was no... Are you now proceeding to deal with grounds four and five? Yes, so I'm going to deal with the... So are, we doing, are, we, are we now on grounds four and five? We are now on grounds four, right. four and five. So, so in the outline submissions document, <coughs> where we've set out uh, 11 submissions, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through each of those submissions. Um, Mr. Bowen, I'm sorry, I'm at a disadvantage because I'm not sure I've seen that. I have a skeleton argument. It's at page 467. If my Lord, turn up page 467 of the core bundle. I hope that your bundles have been updated. Which tab is that? That is uh, Core Bundle. I'm not sure about the tab number, but it's page 467 uh, of Core Bundle. So Bundle 1. Tab 17. Yes. Right. Okay, thank so, you. So that, that provides the hooks on which I'm going to cover my submissions today. Um, so, my lords, as far as uh, the, the background to the extremism analysis unit challenge is concerned. We can begin with a copy of the press release, um, which uh, announced which is how Mr. Bart first learned about all this. Uh, which Why is do we need to? So from, uh, I just want to try to structure this in my own mind. My Lord, yes. The first question uh, is whether or not Article 8 is engaged. Yes, that's so the that's first really question. First and on that point, the judge, the judge said it's not engaged because there's no privacy. There's no reasonable expectation of privacy. There's no reasonable expectation of privacy in a case where what's at issue are all the sorts of things that Mr. Butt wishes to make public and he, yes. wishes, to, he wishes to promote exactly. uh, all these articles. So that's the very first question, yes. which, I, you know, which, is a, which I mean doesn't really require us to look at a picture. I think, well, what it needs you to do, my lord, is to, see, to look at what information they obtained what they did with that information, because it's our case, in a nutshell, that publicly available information can, uh, att can attract a reasonable expectation of privacy, depending on what is done with it and by who. So <clears throat> if you put a Facebook post up on, online, we accept that, uh, generally speaking, you wouldn't have any expectation of privacy in relation to that whenever anybody looks at that Facebook post. You, you, you couldn't expect that to be private. Indeed, that's the very contrary to what you expect. However, if a government body uh, takes a screenshot of that and they then trawl the internet to find other posts, blogs, tweets, or other uh, online presence that you may have, and also searches for your name generally across the internet to find other occasions on which your name has been mentioned, takes screenshots of that, draws it together, and then can, creates a file on you for the purposes of an investigation 
as to whether you are an extremist. And then form an assessment on the basis of that information that you are an extremist. And also obtains information from a third party that has carried out an exercise of that kind. And then you share it with other public bodies. Then we say material that would not have had a reasonable expectation of privacy becomes information that does. In your submission, would that apply if you were investigating a journalist who, uh, in respect of whom all of the material was publicly written material published by him or her with a view to promulgating his views? Well, let's, let's see, my lord. The, the, the famous case where Harriet Harman and, and Patricia Hewitt brought in the Strasbourg court, um, they complained that they had been investigated by the security services who had created a, a file on them for the purposes of de determining whether they were subversives or communist sympathisers. Now, they were public figures. And what the Strasbourg court said was that the creation of a file on somebody for the purposes of determining whether they are an enemy of the people, a subversive in modern parliaments, an extremist, itself creates a reasonable expectation of privacy. And therefore, as soon as a public authority, for the purposes of investigating you, creates a file about you and starts gathering information on you, that creates a reasonable expectation of privacy. Even if all the material has been deliberately published by you as part and parcel of your desire to advance your views in public? Well, my lord, if, it was, if absolutely everything had been published by you, then I, uh, my submission is yes, it still would. But in this case, it wasn't all material that was published by Mr Butt. Because some of it, were, for example, was Facebook posts from universities who had hosted him. So this is the, the point, that, that this is not just about gathering together what, what Mr. Butt had put into the public domain. It was about gathering together everything that is about his public life in order to create a profile. About his public life? About his life in public, yes. I accept that he was speaking in public, although it's an interesting point whether if one's speaking to an Islamic society of students with... Uh, half a dozen members, um, to what extent that is public or whether that is private. But for the purposes of this submission, I'm, I'm happy to say that is a public exercise, a public... Uh, can, you, okay, can, you, can you just... Um, you've done it already, but I just want to try and nail it down. Yes, sir. What exactly it is, and at what point it is, that there's a reasonable expectation of privacy, it, what, what that, that when you... Go, is it, is it when you start to uh, 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 amass the file, or is it that once you've got it as to what you're going to do with it? Well, my, my first submission is, and will be, that the, the commencing of an investigation yes. is, the, is at that point creates a reasonable expectation of privacy. Whenever a public body carries out an investigation into somebody to which some stigma attaches... Is that, is that, is that simple? I'm, uh, yes, my lord. So then the commencing of the investigation by a public body... I'm going to be coming to all of this, my lord, but I'm just giving you the... <laughs> oh, I thought we were right in the middle of it. Well, well my lord, what, this I'm, is it, isn't it? Well, this what, I'm, what I'm proposing to do, my lord, I'm, I'm, I'm in response to your lordship's yes. questions. Yes. Um, but I, what, what, there's a couple of things that I want to take you to before I get there. And what I wanted to do was to show you what information had been gathered on Mr. Mr. Butt. So what I'm doing at the moment is summarising the, the factors which yes. give rise to... I'm happy to take it now. Well, I think, I think we should... Yeah, okay. I think so the first... Really interesting. I understand what you're saying. I want to just want to say that the, 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 the um, commencing of an investigation by a public body to which some stigma attaches gives rise to... To a reasonable expectation. All right. I'm not, I'm not disputing anything you're saying. I'm just trying to make sure no, I've, no, I've recorded sorry. it. So, in fact, there are nine factors. And I'll, I'll, I'll list them, my lord. I was going to come to them later, but I'll give you the nine factors now, and then I'll Thank come you. back to them and show you why I... I say that's the case. But they all have one thing in common. 
And, the, and what they have in common is this, is that the use of information in all of these examples goes beyond that which is normally foreseeable. And that's the phrase I will be coming back to. Because we say that the test that the Strasbourg Court has adopted is to determine whether the use of the information could be said to be normally or reasonably foreseeable. So the first, the first point is that an investigation is open. The second point is the uh, creation of a file and the storing of information on that file. It might, at the, at the outset, just be a name. But we say at, at that point, and the two are obviously closely linked, but I'm going to have to show you that the authorities, in fact, in support of those two propositions are different ones. The third thing is the carrying out of research online to build a profile. The fourth thing is, and this is um, in fact closely connected to the third, is the use of automatic processing to obtain information. And I'll show you that in this case, although we don't know whether it was in fact done in Mr. Butt's case, but the uh, EAU uh, has a social media monitoring policy and that social media monitoring policy explains how it uses a, uh, a research tool called RIPJAR which monitors uh, online social media. How, how do you spell RIPJAR? RIPJAR, R-I-P-J-A-R. What does that stand for? I don't know. It's a, it's a private company. Oh, it's a company. It's a private company that, 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 that monitors social media and you put in a search term and it will it will gather everything there is attached to that search term but we say that that in fact the use of google a google search itself engages automatic processing uh, and the importance of that will become clear but it is as a result of a number of um not only case law, but in fact a convention, the Council of Europe's convention of January 1981, uh, which has been referred to in those case law, that case law, which when automatic processing uh, is used, considers that any information relating to an identified or identifiable individual is private information. So you say Google itself, what would be, Google itself gathers yes. information in this way? In an automatic, or in an automated way. And my Lord, that, that is why, and I'm going to be coming to the, the Google Spain and the right to, right to be forgotten um, uh, concept, but that is why Google is now um, being sued by a number of people who are seeking to obtain orders that they have information that's available on them online uh, delisted because... Well, in case in the Court of Appeal next week. Well, I'm, I'm going to be showing you uh, Mr. Justice Warby's judgment uh, in that case. I think it's the NT1 case, NT1 in yeah. Google. Um, so that's the fourth concept, that if there is uh, automatic processing, that itself um, gives, gives rise to a reasonable expectation of privacy. So are, are all of these individual or, or cumulative? Well, my, my submission is that individually, yeah. they're all capable of creating reasonable expectation, expectation of privacy. Yes. Because they all arose in Mr. Butt's case, then you look at them cumulatively, and cumulatively you would have to come to the conclusion that yes, there was a reasonable expectation of privacy. I've only covered four of them so far. Yes. The fifth one is receiving the fruits of such research from a third party. So where a public authority like the EAU contacts uh, an organisation like Student Rights that, that does this research for itself and says, well, we'd like you to send us any information you have on individuals who are speaking in universities who can be considered extremists, then the soliciting of that information, the obtaining of that information, and the using of that information all give rise to a, a, a reasonable expectation of privacy. And again, there are authorities in support of all of these propositions, but I'm just outlining a few logics now. Sixth. The carrying out of a search on a closed source database. Now, I accept that this is separate from the, the public 
information point. But there's, informa there's evidence that there was a search done on closed source databases, home office databases in Mr. Butt's case, which uh, Mr. Justice Oosley found it could not be excluded that such a search had happened, but the evidence was that it didn't throw anything up. But we say that actually that just the carrying out of a search on a closed source database. Was there a finding that probably it had happened, or was it that he simply said he couldn't exclude it? Well, Mr. Willis, who gave the evidence, said that um, he, couldn't, uh, he couldn't say it hadn't happened. In fact, there's evidence to show that, that a search was authorised, because I'm going to show you the document in which it's ticked <laughs> to say there should be a closed source database search. Um, <clears throat> my Lord's uh, seventh... Well, I will check, sir. What was the question? My, Lord, my, Lord, my Lord's question was, was there evidence that it had actually taken place? There's a different point where it had thrown up anything. Yes. And I think the answer to that was the judge formed the view that it hadn't. Uh, or the evidence was that it probably hadn't. But what was the was the evidence that it had actually taken place? Um, the evidence was that it, it, it had taken place, but nothing had been found. Okay. We we respectfully submit that the, just the carrying out of a search, even if it doesn't, even if it doesn't throw anything up, uh, is a factor to take into account in deciding whether there's a reasonable expectation of privacy. Of course, it all feeds back to the other piece that I read because this is being carried out by a public authority who is carrying out an investigation related to <coughs> something to which a stigma attaches. Um, did, the judge find, did the judge make a finding that it, it ha had taken place? Yes. That's it. Yes. Um, my Lord, the seventh point that gives rise to a reasonable expectation of privacy is the, the use of the publicly available information that's been obtained for the making <coughs> of an assessment that somebody is, for our purposes, an extremist. So once, once the public authority has carried out its investigation, it's gathered all the information, the point at which it then pulls that information together and one of his analysts says here in the EAU says, well, that information leads me to conclude that this man is an extremist. That process constitutes, uh, engages the right to private life. There's an, there's an expectation of privacy in relation to not only the information upon which that is based, but then, of course, the new information, which, of course, Mr. Butt didn't put out there, which is that, in the view of the EAU, he is an extremist. That is separate information in the same way that a view uh, by the police that an individual has been, uh, that there's sufficient information that a person can be charged is a new piece of information. So uh, we say that that process itself engages a reasonable expect expectation of privacy. Eighth, the point at which a public authority shares that information with a third party engages a reasonable expectation of privacy. And of course, in this case, Mr. Butt's information, not only the information that had been gathered on him, but the assessment by the EAU, was shared with the Prime Minister's office. The fact that, in their view, he was an extremist was shared with the Prime Minister's office. So that information... I, I apologise for, for rising, but... That's not right, and I think my little friend is, is just getting confused about the time of events. What was shared with the Prime Minister's office was information about appearance in two, two, um, two, two events at universities. The assessment that was undertaken later on was undertaken further to a parliamentary question that was asked about the press release, and then within the Home Office it was looked at as to whether what was said in the press release was justified. Well. Uh, I, uh, my Lord, Mr. Sanders is right in one way, but he's wrong in another way, and if he'd listened, he would have found out why he didn't need to well, remember What we're dealing with, uh, not sharing the assessment, we're dealing with sharing information. That he is an ex the, 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 the opinion of the EAU, that he is an extremist. Now, that was, a, an assess that was on the basis of the EAU's assessment that they made 
on three occasions before September. They did so uh, in February. Sorry, February which 2015. Year? Yes. They did so in April and June when they put together a, a, a spreadsheet which contained Mr. Butt's um, name and the information upon which they made the assessment. But most, most importantly, in August 2015, a paper was produced on extremism in universities in which Mr. S Mr. Butt was named as an extremist. And that paper was shared with the number 10. And that's why I do need to show you these documents, um, my lords, my lady, because these, as you can see from Mr. Sanders' interjection, it's important to see exactly what it is that I'm talking about when I make my submissions. So that's the eighth uh, reason, the eighth factor, uh, which gives rise to a reasonable expectation of privacy. And the ninth factor, sorry, that was the seventh factor, I'm terribly sorry. No, that was the eighth. So that, that was the eighth, eighth sharing, you're quite right, my lord. The ninth one was disclosure of that information to the world in the press release. Now, I know that the EAU didn't want Number 10 to do that, but that was a press release that was issued by both Number 10 and the Home Office. But by the time you get there, my lords, uh, if you're with me on the other eight factors, then the ninth one doesn't really take matters any uh, considerably, uh, considerable distance further. Now, my lords, uh, it's therefore important, um, if I may, to just take you quickly to those documents. Uh, you will have seen them, but, but it's important um, that I identify uh, what, what they are. And the reason I start with the press release is because really we're starting with uh, what Mr. Butt knew. And, and what Mr. Butt knew is a very important consideration in this case, because uh, one of the issues that your lordships will have to decide is whether Mr. Butt could have exercised his rights at an earlier point particular at the point at which the EAU started to investigate him, because at that stage he would have been able, if he'd known about it, to make a subject access request and then to appeal whatever was being, whatever processing was being done to the uh, information commissioner and thereafter to the information tribunal. And so it's an important point to bear in mind what happened before Mr. Butt knew what was going on uh, and whether before that point he could have been expected to have exercised any of his rights. <coughs> so analytically, what does that go to, whether or not Article 8 was engaged, or if it was engaged, whether or not A2 was satisfied? Well, it, it actually goes to, to both, my lord, because if somebody is warned in advance, one of the cases I'm going to take you to is a case called W against the Secretary of State for Health, where um, uh, the, uh, the fact that somebody had received NHS treatment uh, was disclosed uh, to another government uh, ministry. But people who, this was if they were uh, foreigners who were receiving free, free health, healthcare trust and who should be free healthcare services who ought to be charged for it. And they were told in advance that if they didn't pay for it, then that fact would be disclosed. And that was held not to give rise to a reasonable expectation of privacy because although the information was private, they had known that this was going to happen. So that goes to the question of whether knowledge and foresight uh, gives rise to a reasonable expectation of privacy. But it's also relevant to the question of whether there is a, a breach, because one of the points that uh, I will be pressing very strongly in relation to Article 8.2 is that in order for the law to be compliant with Article 8.2, an individual must be notified of the fact that they are the subject of surveillance. And the question of how they are notified and what. Do you draw any distinction between surveillance and monitoring for this purpose? I will hope to have persuaded your lordships by the end of my case that the two are indistinguishable when carried out by the EAU. It's our case that this is, is surveillance, and indeed it is my case that it amounts to directed surveillance within the meaning of the 
Regulation and Investigatory Powers Act. That's a, that's a very, very broad proposition you've just outlined. That Article 282 compliance requires notification to the subject of surveillance. Do you, do you really mean it as broadly as that? There are, there's only one exception that the Strasbourg Court has accepted. So what, what, the, what they say is, is that you must have notification at the point at which notification will no longer prejudice the investigation. So it can happen after the surveillance has happened. But there has to be a point at which the individual knows that they have been the subject of surveillance in order for them to exercise their, their Article 82 remedy. Now, the question of whether there's any exception to that was, has been considered. And the one exception that has been found is where an individual is the subject of a, an R, a RIPA surveillance and there's an authorization in place. It's been held that the availability of a remedy in front of the IPT, the Investigatory Powers Tribunal, is sufficient because it doesn't depend upon a person being notified of the fact that they are, they don't need to prove that they have been the subject of surveillance. They can make a, an application if they just suspect. Now, um, my lords, that is, the, that, is the, that is where we've got to with the Strasbourg case law. So you do have to have notification, except where you've got a right of appeal to someone like the IPT, which doesn't depend on proving that you have been the subject of surveillance. In the CJEU, the position is, uh, is, is, is harder edged. The, in the Watson Tele2 Severige case, I'm going to call it Watson if I, if I may, the Grand Chamber of the CJEU on the reference that was brought from this court, the court has said that uh, there has to be notification. It can happen after the event, and it can happen once it's no longer likely to prejudice the investigation. But there has to be invested. But there has to be notification. So yes, my lord, that is my submission. Um, <coughs> so my lord, the 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 first that Mr. Buck knew about this was in September 2015 when uh, newspaper reports reported the press release that was produced by Number Ten. I, I'm aware my lady, my lady, lady Sharp has seen the press release before. If I could just take my lords to it very quickly, it's, a, it's in the core bundle. It's a tab, uh, it's a section A, page 18. Do we, do we need uh, at all to look at the defamation judgment? No. Uh, so save, save to this extent, Mr. Uh, Justice Nicholl accepted that uh, the, the press release was to be meant, was to be interpreted as meaning uh, Mr. Buck was considered to be an extremist hate speaker uh, against whose pernicious influence university students should be protected. Um, now I know that that is an issue that's been appealed, so in one sense uh, it, it's, it's a matter that's yet to be resolved. But um, uh, what one finds at page 18 is the, is the press release. Uh, I think it's the supplementary bundle, not the core bundle, isn't it? You're quite right, my lord. I, I, I thought it was in the core bundle. It's, it's bundle two. <coughs> it's bundle two. It's bundle two. It's bundle two. It's bundle two. A2. A2, tab, uh, page oh, I, see. I, I will be using page numbers within the sections, um, because page numbers will appear at the top of the page. And uh, this is a press release from the Prime Minister's <coughs> office, um, number 10 Downing Street, and from the Home Office. You can see that uh, at the top of the page at A18. Um, the heading, a new duty to stop extremists radicalising students on campuses is scheduled to come into force. 21st of September. Uh, then 
first paragraph, for the first time, universities and colleges in the UK will be legally required to put in place specific policies to stop extremists radicalising students on campuses, tackle gender segregation in debates, and support students at risk of radicalisation. Um, next paragraph, the updated prevent duty guidance scheduled to come into force by the 21st of September requires establishments to ensure they have proper risk assessment processes for speakers and ensure those espousing extremist views do not go unchallenged. And then over the page, um, last year at least 70 events featuring hate speakers were held on campuses according to the government's new extremism analysis unit established to support all government departments and the wider public sector to understand extremism. Uh, and then uh, under notes to editors at the bottom of that page, the extremism analysis unit has been established to support all government departments and the wider public sector to understand extremism so they can deal with extremists appropriately. In 2014, there were at least 70 events involving speakers known to have promoted rhetoric that aimed to undermine core British values of democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty and mutual respect and tolerance of all the different faiths and beliefs held on university campuses. Queen Mary, King's College, SOAS and Kingston University held most events. Events include the hosting of six speakers that are on record as expressing views contrary to British values, including, and then the last name, Dr. Salman Butt. Um, and then the last two lines of the next paragraph, the duty, that's the prevent duty, is about protecting people from the poisonous and pernicious influence of extremist ideas that are used to legitimise terrorism. Uh, and uh, as I said, Mr Justice Nicholl, that the ordinary natural meaning of the words were that Mr. Bart was considered to be one of the people from whose <coughs> poisonous and pernicious influence uh, students should be protected. Um, Mr. Bart, when he found out about uh, this, he found out about it from news reports. Um, we've only put in one of the news reports, but you'll see on the pages following, page 22, the report. Um, <coughs> TV, TV, uh, where, where that now? page 22 of the same, the same bundle. Do you have a tab? It's, it's just the next page. It's just the next page. It's the same side bundle. It's page tw A22 at the top of the page. Uh, and and uh, there were a number of reports. We only put one of them in, my lords, because it's just necessary, not necessary for you to see all of them. Um, but at the bottom of the page, leading universities have been named by David Cameron for giving a platform to extremists as a new legal duty on institutions to protect impressionable young minds was announced. Okay, the names of the universities, and then over the page, um, among the speakers were, and the second line, Dr. Salman Butt, with all publicly denounced British values. Um, now, my Lord, uh, Mr. Butt uh, went to his MP, Fiona McTaggart, she made a, uh, a request to the Home Office for uh, information about Mr. Uh, about how they had reached that conclusion uh, and asked a, uh, a question in Parliament. This is all in the chronology, so I don't need to take your, your lordships to it but because it's, it's got the pages, but if you look at page 39 in the core bundle, you'll find a chronology which sets out the key events. Um, <coughs> Mr. Butt himself carried out a Google search on the extremism and analysis unit. Page 39, my lord, of the core bundle. So page number at the top of the page. It's, the whole bundle is, is paginated consecutively. And the chronology, so it's section three, my lord. Yes. yes. Um, and Mr. Butt, in his witness statement, explains how he had carried out a, 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 uh, an online search for the extremism analysis unit. The first thing that came up was the press release. The second thing that came up was an FOIA uh, request response that was made back in May of 2015, which I will take your lordships to. It's back in tab uh, volume 2 uh, section A page 26 <coughs> tab 3 of volume 2 
A26. Do your Lordships have that? Yes. Uh, this is a letter written by the Home Office to uh, Mr. McIntyre from whatthenow.com, uh, who, incidentally, I found out yesterday, is the chairman of Digital Rights Ireland. Uh, he now does that job, but anyway, he, he was asking questions on behalf of whatthenow.com back in April uh, of 2015. And the response was, uh, the questions that he asked is, what is the role of the unit? Is there a document setting out its remit? Um, today's comments, so there have obviously been some public comments, stated that the unit will identify which individuals and organisations are extremist and should not be engaged with. Could you please provide more details as to what this entails? In particular, how will individuals and groups be referred to the unit? With whom will these determinations be shared and what effect legal or other will they have? Uh, and how will the extremism analysis unit engage with material hosted on the internet? Is it proposed to seek with the removal or blocking of material determined to be extremist? Uh, the letter was treated as an FOIA request, and the, they said this, we can confirm the Home Office holds information on the role of the EAU. However, following careful consideration, we've decided that this information is exempt from disclosure by virtue of the exemptions at Section 35.1 of the Freedom of Information Act pertaining to the formulation of government policy. Section 35 is a qualified exemption and requires consideration of a public interest test. Mind, what is Section 35? Section 35 is the um, qualified exemption from disclosure what? Uh, to request for free freedom of information requests. No, I understand that. What, it, what he's, they're relying upon a qualified exemption. Just yes. remind us what the exemption is. It's um, the, the formulation of government policy. It's a qualified exemption, so it requires a balance, public interest balance test, and they decided that, that the public interest re required that it remain uh, secret. And then the, la the next paragraph, in addition, we neither confirm nor deny whether any further information within the scope of the request is held by reliance on section 23.5, information supplied by or relating to bodies dealing with security matters. Uh, and my Lord, section 23 is an absolute exemption in relation to national security matters. Um, and then question two or three of your request, question two sort of, this is the next paragraph down, sort of information on how the EAU will be tasked and how it will identify extremist individuals and organisations. The EAU has been established to provide analysis of extremism. The focus of the EAU will be extremism in this country and overseas, which has a direct impact on the UK, UK interests. EAU is a cross-government resource with government departments able to commission research and analysis. The EAU will use the agreed government definition of extremism, the vocal or active opposition to fundamental British values, etc. Um, so you know, that, that was what Mr. Butt found when he tried to carry out uh, his own investigations. In due course, a response came back from the Home Office, uh, and you'll find the response um, at page A25 uh, in the same, uh, the same tab. So if you go back a couple of pages, <coughs> you'll see the request, uh, the PNQ by Fiona McTaggart, and the answer by Karen Bradley. Answered on the 1st of December 2015, um, when Karen Bradley, MP, said, Home Office has information on 70 events held on university campuses in 2014 involving speakers who were considered by the Home Office to have expressed views contrary to fundamental British values. Dr. Salman Butt, the chief editor of Islam 21C, a publication that hosts material contrary to British values, and has himself expressed views of concern in the publication and on social media, appearing to compare homosexuality to paedophilia as a sin and supporting the FGM. And my Lord, you'll be able to form your own views about this because you're going to see the information upon which the assessment is based. He's spoken alongside Cage and used social media to support Cage's position on Mohammed M. Wazi, Jihadi John, which has been to try to justify his resort to violence. And my Lord, in the light of that response, Mr. Uh, Butt instructed solicitors, and on the 11th of December, they, uh, 11th of December 2015, wrote to the Home Office, um, and you'll find this in volume two at section D1. I don't need to take you to it. D1, section D, page one, which was the letter before claim, 
but also included a subject access request under Section 7 of the Data Protection Act and a data subject notice under Section 10 of the Data Protection Act requiring the Home Office to stop processing Mr Butt's uh, material. And on the 15th of January of 2016, the Home Office replied refusing to stop processing Mr Butt's data. You can find that at page 413 of the Core Bible. Again, I don't need to take you to it. And on the 29th of January, they responded to the letter before claim uh, and enclosed their response to the subject access request, which I will take you to. But the letter in which they responded is at page 415 of the core bundle, and the response to the subject access request is at page 418 of the core bundle. If I, ask, if I could ask your lordships to turn that up. CB418. This document needs to be read alongside the witness statement of Mr. Paul Willis, who was, at the time he made his witness statement, the director of the Extremism and Analysis Unit. And his witness statement is in bundle two. If you have that alongside, perhaps, your core bundles, bundle one, while looking at this document. His, uh, wit his witness statement. Mr. Willis yes. is in volume two, yes. uh, section B, and it begins at page 25. <coughs> Sorry, that's a bit, it begins at page B1, but yeah, for B1. our purposes yeah. it's B25 is the first reference to Mr. Butt. Perhaps, my lords, if I just draw your attention to the key passages in Mr. Willis's uh, statement, they're at 7.10, which is at page B25, and you can see where he said this. In the context of this case, it's relevant to note that the EAU has been provided with information by the Henry Jackson Society. Do your lordships have that? 7.10. Yes which has established an organisation called Student Rights in order to understand extremism on university campuses and undertake related lobbying. Um, I would, just for present purposes, um, it doesn't matter what the, uh, the nature of that organisation is, the Henry Jackson Society, I'm not going to make any submissions on it. All that you need to know is that they were independent of the Home Office and they were a, pri they were a private body. The origin of the provision of information to the EAU by student rights is that in around 2013, and prior to the establishment of the unit, one of the uh, higher education prevent coordinators met with student rights and asked whether they could provide the information they were already sending to the Home Office in the form of a weekly digest instead of on, on an ad hoc basis. They were happy to do this. Um, uh, the PDU prevent, prevent duty unit was added to the distrib distribution list, and when the EAU was established, it began receiving these weekly digests too. The EAU still receives the digests, uh, but student rights were not asked to undertake the work and they didn't receive any government funds. And then, that last line, that the claimant was named in one student rights digest dated the 14th of October 2014. And then if you pick it up at page 29 of the Bible, at the bottom of the page, in paragraph 10.1, information relating to the claimant Leaving aside its response to his subject access request under Section 7, the EAU has processed the claimant's personal data on three occasions. On each occasion, the data has been processed by analysts working with an informatic and other extremist team. Uh, first, in February 2015, the unit was asked by the then Director General of the OSC team if it could provide a rough, ass rough assessment of how many events had taken place on university campuses in 2014 involving individuals who had expressed extremist views. The unit had very limited time, the course of an afternoon, in which to complete this task and largely relied on information provided by student rights. The analyst involved in this work used his judgment as to whether the information or evidence provided by student rights would meet the unit's threshold for individuals 
who had previously expressed views contrary to fundamental values, and then verify the events independently where possible. <coughs> and it's noted by the analyst from the student rights information there were two events where the claimant had spoken. So, my lords, we, we say that at this point uh, there are two factors uh, that are engaged that uh, give rise to a reasonable expectation of privacy. Just going back to my list of nine, there's the receipt of the information from student rights, and there's the analysis by the EAU analyst. Um, uh, and the verification of the information. Uh, so in 10.3, whilst the EAU was established in 2014, it operated in a skeleton form until around the beginning of 2050. This early piece of work was completed in the first couple of weeks of the EAU's, EAU's work proper before any of its unit specific policies and processes were in place. I understand that privacy issues were not considered by the analyst, analyst at this stage. However, even if the research policy had been in place, he would probably not have considered that privacy issues were engaged, because applying up paragraph 8, uh, and this is a policy that I'll have to show you, Lordships, the analyst was not monitoring or conducting repeated research into anyone over an extended period. He was not creating a profile on anyone, using information from a number of sources, and he was not doing any research on named individuals, but was utilising existing material. And my Lords, uh, I, I will explain wh why it is that, in fact, all of those things were being done in Mr. Butt's case. Secondly, in March 2015, another analyst in the EAU commenced a much more in-depth piece of research on extremism in universities in East and South East London. Uh, and <clears throat> pursuant to a request from the Director General of the uh, Office for uh, Security and Counterterrorism, asked the EAU to look at the issue of extremism in universities in more detail. The request was in the context of the introduction of the Prevent Duty Guidance, and the research was later published in November 2015 as extremism in universities, and the claimant was not referred to in this paper. So you don't need to worry about that particular piece of work. However, at 10.5, the analysts met with student rights in around March 2015 to ask about their understanding of extremism at London universities. She didn't share any information held by the EAU, but sought the views and findings of student rights. And while I was just pausing there, we will demonstrate why a government body that engages a private organisation and encourages them to obtain information themselves is fixed with responsibility for that private individual. The analyst, uh, sorry, this resulted in student rights sending her a paper in or around May 2015 based on their research into extremist events at selected London universities. The analyst took this and the previous EAU piece of work on events in 2014 and included some of it in her work. This included the two events mentioned above involving the claimant. An early draft of this paper was prepared by August 2015, marked draft, and included information about the claimant. And my lords, just if you keep your uh, finger on that page and go to page 133 of section B, you will see a copy of that paper. B133 is the page at the top. Is that the early draft? That's the early draft. And if you look at paragraph four on that page, during 2014, events held on campus by sample universities included the hosting of six speakers that are on record in expressing views contrary to British values, including, and then it redacted, Dr. Simon Butt. So he's being assessed at this point as an extremist, applying the, uh, the definition of extremism. So that's the, the view, the <coughs> view of the analyst in August 2015, so before any, um, any press release is issued. And you'll see that it refers to Annex 3 for an overview of speakers, but that annex has not been disclosed. So going back to page... B31, if you've kept your fingers uh, there. So, my lords, paragraph 10.6, the document that's referred to there is the document I've just shown you. Uh, and Mr. Willis said this, privacy issues relating to the claimant were not the subject of any freestanding consideration at that time, but no new information was obtained about him. He was not the subject of any further research, and I do not think any such issues were engaged. Well, my lords, that's an issue, of course, for you. 
And then in 10.7, when number 10 was putting together a press release to coincide with the coming into force of the Prevent Duty Guidance for further and higher education institutions, a request was made for case studies on extremists speaking on campuses for possible inclusion. In response to this request, information cut and pasted from the draft extremism in universities paper was sent by somebody within the Prevent Duty unit who had previously seen a copy. This information included the six names which ultimately appeared in the press release, including the claimants. So, my lords, we say there is a further um, act of the EAU at this stage when they take the information contained in the August 2015 paper, which I've just shown you, in which Mr. Butt is assessed as being an extremist. They cut and paste that information and they send it to the number 10 unit. Now, um, it's right to say, and you, if one reads on, you'll see that the EAU gave permission for the use in the press release of the figure of 70 events on campus in 2014, but they did not give permission for the names to be used. And my lords, again, if you keep your finger on that page and go back to page B134, <coughs> this is an email, um, though it's blanked out as to who it's from and to, uh, one deduces that this is an email from the EAU to somebody in the number 10 press office. Um, and the emails go on over the next few pages, but the only one I want to show you is this one at the top of page B134. I've replied to this separately attached. These are examples from EAU analysis, and I have noted that we do not want to include any more detail from our analysis. And then this, I'm very nervous about the presentation of EAU spying on students on campus, which is how this could be misinterpreted. My lords, we submit that that is very telling. Nobody was suggesting at that stage that that's what they're doing. That is the concern that the EAU had, that what they were doing would be misinterpreted as spying on campus. And we respect the Spying on students. Spying on students on campus. Um, but the, the, the phrase spying is one that appears in that email for the first time and not in response to any assertion that they're spying. That's, that's, that's an internal email from the EAU expressing what, their concern. What, what is it? So, so what is the significance of that in your submission? The significance of it is, is that that's how the EAU are concerned this is going to be seen. Right. If they put names... They're, they're saying that's not what it is, but it might be misinterpreted. Indeed. And we say, well, in fact, that's very telling, because indeed it, it demonstrates that they knew what they were doing was sufficient that people would see it, or might see it, as spying. I don't place any particular significance on it, only to show that it, it is a tell, if you like, of how the EAU saw what they were doing themselves. So we should... I'm not asking you to draw, analytical significance. to draw any particular inference from The point from is, it. that's why they didn't want the names published. Yeah. But that so is why they didn't the want the names published. The fact that they're not wanting the names published is the relevant point, isn't it? That is the relevant point. Yeah. But in fact, the names were published. If one goes back to page B31, that is explained in paragraph 10.8 of Mr. Willis's statement. And then in paragraph 10.9, he explains how after the press release and after the uh, parliamentary question by Jim Taggart, the EAU were asked to carry out further research because of the fact that a question had been raised about the press release by uh, Fiona McTaggart. At that point, the EAU carried out further research um, which Mr. Willis says was the first time they carried out independent research of their own. Um, although we will, we respectfully submit that in fact they had already carried out research of their own. For example, back in February 2015, when the analyst had been uh, verifying information that had been provided by student rights. Uh, but paragraph 10.9, following the issue of the press release in October 2015, EAU for the first time conducted its own research on the claimant to produce a profile. Um, <clears throat> this research consisted of keywords on Google using the claimant's name. This would have taken the analyst to other sites for a review of his social media output and of material on Islam 21C. 
the information in the profile came from Islam 21C, Facebook and Twitter, including the Facebook and Twitter accounts of the Islamic societies at Goldsmiths, Imperial and City University. So this comes back to the point, my Lord. It's not just in the material that Mr Butts put into the public domain, it's material that other people have put about him into the public domain. The research verified the material previously supplied by student rights, found some new material, and ascertained that the claimant had spoken at further events at universities during 20, 2014 and 15. And then this, an EAU Form 1, Part A for this analysis, was completed. Um, <clears throat> and you'll find uh, the EAU uh, Form 1, um, <clears throat> uh, which is at page... Uh, sorry, my Lord, I'll... I'll I'll get it in just a moment. I had it just a moment ago. It's page, page B142. So if you go back to, um, to, so further forward again, B142 exhibited to Mr. Willis's statement. This is the EAU Form 1 that was completed by the EAU in October of 2015. explains the nature of the research and the investigation to be undertaken. <coughs> research undertaken into six individuals named in the number 10 press release. Um, the date it was commenced, the date it was completed, the names of the subjects including Mr. Dr. Butt. And then the next heading, what sources will be used, open source information such as internet and social media, and home office databases was also uh, blocked out. Is the proposal necessary? It sets out uh, to check whether the subject has any links to extremism or extremist views to produce a speaker profile and inform a submission on correspondence related to the number 10 press release on extremist speakers at universities. So this piece of work, it's accepted, is, um, is a response to the parliamentary question that had been raised by Fiona McTaggart, which had been raised in the light of the press release. Well, it might also be thought to be a response to the fact that number 10 had publicised the names, because it's not only your client who went through this process at this time, it's the six people who were named by number 10, which the EA didn't want to be named. Yes. Um, so, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord, if we um, now go to the material that was in fact generated, and that's the material in Core Bundle, starting at page 418, one can now see how that material relates to the course of events that I've just taken you through. So it's core bundle, page 418. And running through to page 424. <coughs> so the first page of the, this is the material that was produced as part of the subject access request. The first point to make is that this is an, these are extracts from what is in the EAU files. These are not the actual documents. Um, but the first document, uh, first page, is an extract from material provided by student rights on the promotion of Islamist extremist events. So this was the material that was given to the, to the EAU analyst after she had been to visit him in March 2015. Or the, an extract from that material. And one can see the information that was provided included two events at which Mr. Butt had spoken. And you'll see that it relates to uh, an event on the 27th of November 2014 called Sowing the Seeds of Success, um, hosted by the Islamic Society. Uh, details about Mr. Butt as the chief editor of Islam 21C, part of Haytham al Haddad's MRDF network. Um, so if you go and look at the footnotes to those, um, you'll see that uh, they refer to it's the, the first footnote is to a Facebook page from City University Islamic Society, the second one uh, to Dr. Salman Butt himself on Islam 21C, uh, similarly uh, three and four. You can see at five that screenshots of all activity was archived by student rights. And then under the, <coughs> uh, under the main heading, um, in the middle of the page, he's equated homosexuality with paedophilia and defended gender segregation, as well as claiming criticism of segregation and FGM as an attack on Islam 
In online posts, he's also celebrated the kidnapping of Israeli soldiers and referred to Israeli soldiers, Israelis as pigs. Now, my lords, you're going to see these posts in a, in a moment. You're going to see the posts as part of the, uh, the research that was done in October by uh, the EAU. And the point to bear in mind is that all this research had already been done, most of it had been done by uh, the student rights organisation. And if you're with me, as I hope you will be when I show you the authorities, that uh, where a private person carries out investigations, research, surveillance, whatever one calls it, uh, at the request of and with the encouragement of a public body, then that public body is fixed with responsibility for it. It doesn't matter that all this information was gathered by student rights rather than by the EAU. Was this information that um, the student rights, rights organisation already had um, before the bust was deleted by the um, was it information that went out in the box after the bust? We don't, we don't know. We don't know the answer to that question. And in my respect for submission, it shouldn't make any difference. Although there was a gap between March 2015 when the analysts met with student rights and asked for uh, for their, the, the information they had, and May when this information was sent to them by student rights. And one can therefore assume that between March and, and, and infer that between March and May... Remember the date when they were asked? March, my lady. March. March 2015. What, what happened then? That was when the EAU analyst met with student rights. It's paragraph 10.5 of Mr. Willis's statement. The analysts met with student rights in or around March 2015 to ask about their understanding of extremism at London universities. She sought the views and findings of student rights. This resulted in student rights sending her a paper in or around May 2015. So that's, that's the evidence. And what we respectfully submit is that, in fact, for the purposes of the analysis, it doesn't matter whether this was material they'd already obtained or whether they went out and obtained further information uh, after that meeting. But we would respectfully submit that if you consider it is relevant, then the ordinary natural inference from the evidence that you do have is that student rights uh, obtain further information. And my, lo my lords, my lady... <coughs> That is the extract, so we've never well, seen... it is relevant because it's relevant to your question of certification, maybe which is one of your factors. Yes. Well, if a, if a public authority solicits information, then the fact that the private body's already got it, uh, or whether the private body then goes out and gets it, in one sense is, is neither here nor there. It's the soliciting and the receiving of that information that's important. I mean, it may well be important, my lady, when it comes to questions around whether a directed surveillance authorization is required. So I'm going to be taking you to the covert surveillance guidance in a moment, which makes it very clear that if a public body asks a third party to carry out what amounts to directed surveillance, then they need to get an authorization for that. So it would be relevant, I accept, in relation to that question. But in relation to the question of whether there's a reasonable expectation of privacy, um, respectfully, I submit that it doesn't matter. It's the solicitation and the asking for the information that's important. So my, my, my lady, my lords, if you turn over the page to page 419, what you then have is <coughs> two, uh, two tables, uh, spreadsheets produced by the Extremism Analysis Unit. Uh, again, extracts um, which include the two events at Mr. which Mr. Butt spoke. So this is, this is now the EAU using the information that they've been provided with to form an analysis of uh, who, who fits within the category of extremists who speak at London universities. I think this page answers your, your earlier question, probably, because if you look at the top uh, row, <coughs> right-hand side, the information about your client is recorded in the Student Rights Digest of October 2014. So that would rather imply that it was already collected by the Student Rights Organisation by October the year before. Yes. Um, 
I mean, what, what we don't know is when is when the student you, student rights obtain information, because we know that in, for example, the first time that Mr. Butters mentions this is paragraph seven point ten of Mr. Willis's statement, is October is a is a bulletin produced by student rights yep. relating to October twenty fourteen. Um, so it's it's not clear exactly when student rights obtain information, but but my lord, uh, uh, I we appreciate you say it doesn't matter. That's my what it's worth. that's my submission. But I, I appreciate um, the point that your lordship makes. Uh, so those are two uh, two pieces of work, if you like, carried out by the EAU on the basis of information that's been provided to them by um, the by student rights. And you've seen already uh, the further piece of work that was done uh, in August 2015 by the analyst when she produced the paper, the draft of which you have at page. B133. Can, can we just go back to Paul one now just to understand this? So this is the point at which you're saying this right, that they're building the profile. Yes. Right. So they're building the they're building the profile. So they're setting up uh, um, in relation to Mr. to to, to uh, your crime, um, they're setting out what it is that, that in their view makes him somebody worthy of their attention. Yes. So the first item comes, it seems to be, something which comes from the Student Rights Digest, the date of 14th of October 2015. Yes. So there's a date on the other side of the 15th of October 2015, which is quite sure um, the man is up. And then uh, what they have said is a reference paid presumably to, presumably to the Student's Rights Digest. Yes. And we know that they were receiving those regularly uh, through 2014. <coughs> The EAU. Yes, the EAU were receiving digests and then they received the report from the EAU in May. And so what I would suggest that is that the 29th of April 2015 extract is based on information that they've got from the bulletins or digests uh, because we know that they didn't receive the report from student rights until May. But then the spreadsheet that was carried out on the 26th of June the extract that you can see on page 419 in the bottom one would have been carried out in the light of the information by that stage they had received from student rights. But, my Lord, if it assists, um, it just, with, just with the timing, um, e the EAU was established in a skeleton form in December 2014. So the October 2014 digest wouldn't have been would have been under the, the pre-EAU arrangement where there was some way to prevent deliver, delivery unit who was receiving them. Well, I'm, I'm, we've seen, I've, I've taken you to paragraph 710, in which that's explained in Mr. Willis's uh, statement that before the EAU was formed, student rights were sending these, these digests to government departments and the EAU asked to be put on their distribution list. So at the bottom of the page, though, on page 419, uh, we respectfully submit there is an analysis by the EAU of the information that they've been provided and the product that one sees coming so the, from The first them. one above it, it relates to Imperial College. Yes. Then, then you come down to the second one. This is from this is an extract from Spreadsheet. Yes, well, in fact, the first, so is, the first event is the same event. It's the same event. Yes, but there's now an additional event which presumably is information that they've gleaned since the since student rights gave them the report in May. And, and indeed that marries up with the information that you have in the extract. Um, um, the City University event on the 27th of November 2014 page 418, the first event, is not one that appears in the spreadsheet on the 29th of April, but it does appear in the spreadsheet of the 26th of June. Yes. So, my lords, um, what you then get is the report that's produced by the EAU analyst in August 2015, which I showed you at page B133 in which she wrote that a number of speakers 
uh, who were who fell within the definition of extremism had in, had had spoken at British University uh, on the university campuses and included Dr. Butt. So, my lords, those are all things that happened before September 2015. And then, of course, we have the process by which that information is shared with number 10, namely the cut and paste from the August 2015 draft report, which is sent to uh, number 10. And we know that number 10 then published the names, um, but without the EAU's blessing. Although I would stress that the press release is issued by the Home Office as well as by number 10. Uh, so I'm not quite sure how far that goes. Um, and then <coughs> over the page on page 420, you now have uh, the material that the EAU generated in the light of the request after the press release. But in fact, <coughs> and I won't go through it with you in, uh, in fine detail, most of the posts that are referred to in the material that's extracted from the student rights paper in, uh, in March, sorry, in May, is actually referred to in this submission. One, one sees a more detailed Who is analysis. this a submission to? <coughs> uh, I, I mean, term <coughs> submission. Submission to whom or to what? Um, all we know from Mr. Willis's statement is that further research was carried out um, following the press release. We don't have any details of who asked for it or why. Um, one would expect that this was an analyst within the EAU submitting to her, his or her superiors within the EAU, whether there's onward transmission, well, we don't know. So it would depend on what the superior decides to do. Yes. Well, we do, we do know that, that in due course, there's a response to the parliamentary question by Karen Bradley, yeah. which follows this piece of research. And that is the piece of, that is the response to which I've, I've taken your lordships. So, and this is a more detailed piece of work, and our case is that well, that most of this information had already been was already in the possession of the EAU, um, that they had already carried out a number of acts of processing before September, before, before they carried out this piece of work, and therefore that a reasonable expectation of privacy had already arisen. But we also submit that in relation to this piece of work in October 2015 a reasonable expectation of privacy also arose in relation to this, because at that stage, all Dr. Butt knew was what was, the, what was in the press release uh, and in the newspapers, <coughs> and what was in the FOIA response, the 22nd of May 2015, from Mr. McIntyre, in which the, EA, the Home Office had said, yes, we've got information on the EAU, but it's not in the interest of, it's not in the public interest to disclose it, and in any event it contains material related to the security services. So we would respectfully submit that at that stage it wouldn't be reasonable to have expected them to have made a subject access request at that stage. Um, and indeed, it's only once he obtains uh, advice that he does so in December 2015. Um, but my lords, I don't, I don't need to take you through this in any great detail to demonstrate that it is a more detailed profile of Mr. Uh, Dr. Butt, which includes, for example, if you turn to page 421, um, <coughs> under the heading Key Judgments, um, he's uh, the Chief Editor of Islam, 21, 21st Century, a publication that's hosted material contrary to British values. He's expressed views opposed to British values in this publication and on social media. He's associated with a network of concerning Salafi speakers. Uh, and on one of the four occasions when he spoke at universities, he appeared alongside Cage and has used social media to support Cage's position on Jihadi John. Um, uh, and if one then looks at, at the heading evidence, you will see uh, screenshots. And what we don't know is whether these are the very same screenshots that have been captured by student rights that I showed you on page 418 
number of screenshots have been captured by uh, student rights, uh, and it appears, um, although I, I, I will, um, I'm not going to take time up now matching every single one up with what's in on page 418, but these posts uh, do relate to the same material uh, that was gathered by uh, student rights. And, and what I respectfully submit without taking your lordships through it is that that material, there's nothing in that material, nothing in that material that warrants a conclusion that Dr. Butt is an extremist, even on the government's own assessment. Is, is this a position that it will be a matter for your, for your lordships? So what I, sorry, not, not for the, the not, no, sorry. For your ladyship in the other case, I accept that. So you you are not. I, I will not ask you to, to to rule on that. But what we do say is that when you when we come to look at the test of extremism, when you come to look at the test of extremism, I will be asking you to consider whether that test is overbroad. And if this is considered to fall within it, then we respectfully submit that that itself is evidence of its overbreadth. And well, let me put it this way, my lady. Rather than my making a submission that it doesn't amount to extremism within the definition, because that is a matter, that is not a matter before the court. What I do submit is that that evidence was taken to be sufficient evidence of extremism. And on that basis, it is open to you to find that the definition, it is evidence that the definition is overbroad. But it's not the only evidence that you need in order to reach that conclusion. Well, my lady, it, my case is I don't need evidence of that. Yes, you can, you can look at the test, you can ask yourself the question, is this, is this a test which is likely to catch people who are not, uh, who are not people who um, the state should be exercising powers in relation to? And if you reach that conclusion, then you don't need any evidence that it has been used in that way at all. I, uh, that's absolutely right. Um, but what we do say is that this illustrates the very point that we make in relation to overbreadth. Um, my lords, my lady, um, I don't need to show you any more of um, the documents concerning uh, what was what was carried out um, in relation to Dr. Butt. Um, I do need to address this question before we, we turn to my legal submissions of what and whether Mr. Butt could have Dr. Butt could have exercised his rights any earlier, um, and, and there's several points to make about, about this. The first one is that the EAU was intended to operate covertly. And you'll find that because it was a conclusion reached by the judge in his uh, judgment at paragraph 229. Um, and if I give you the reference, it's page 84 of the core bundle. But I'll just read it to you. Um, paragraph 229. 229, So this, I accept that the EAU operates covertly in the sense that the existence and purpose of the EAU is not widely known and its activities were not notified to the subject of the research. I also accept that the data collected in the course of research is not, at least at present, deleted and may be kept indefinitely and that student rights was a private source. And then if you look at um, Mr. Willis's statement at page B13 in volume 2, Paragraph 2.32 of his statement. <coughs> Where he said this, I'm aware that the claimant solicitors have sought to portray the EAU as in some way secretive or shadowy. The unit inevitably... Page, page, page B13, my name. Uh, so it's Mr. Yes, Willis's <laughs> statement. <laughs> Yes. Um, 
Edwards can read that paragraph. Uh, yes, we'll, we'll read that. We inevitably operate confidentially because we process personal data related to both non extremists and extremists. <coughs> and our judgment suggests that, i.e., confidential. Publication of our product would be unwelcome for many of those involved and unnecessarily counterproductive and draws into the very area which we are seeking objectively and dispassionately to analyze. So the bottom line is it's, it's supposed to happen in a way that the subject of the investigation doesn't know. Um, and my lords, at the time this was happening, there were no government documents uh, that set out the existence of uh, or the status of the EAU, apart from that response to the FOIA request that I showed you on the 22nd of May. The first reference in a public document is in a, is in a, um, a document policy strategy called the Counter-Extremism Strategy. I slightly lost what I'm getting to now. Sorry. Just pause. Are you relying upon this paragraph, 2.32, of Mr. Witness's written statement to support the conclusion that, the submission, that uh, Article 8 is engaged because if they themselves operate confidentially and they recognize the publication of the product should be unwelcome for those involved, that, that in itself covers question of reasonable expectations. Yes. You are, because you haven't made that point. Yes, well, I, I, think, I, what I, what I, I think I outlined previously that the question is whether a use of material can be reasonably foreseen. And if you are notified of the fact that a use is going to be made of that material, then clearly that use will be reasonably foreseeable. And that is, that is relevant both to the question of whether you have a reasonable expectation of privacy and also in relation to the question of, of compliance. I mentioned a case called W or the Secretary of State for Health, and I was going to take you to it in a moment, which, in which the Court of Appeal said that where somebody's been told that information is going to be used in a particular way, then they have no reasonable expectation of privacy in relation to it. But the, but, but the converse of that is if you're not told, and it's intended that the material is supposed to be gathered in a confidential way or a secret way or a covert way, then that person cannot be said to have a reasonable, can't reasonably foresee that that information is going to be used in that way. Therefore, that is relevant to the question of whether they have a reasonable expectation. Relevant, but not determinative. Not, not determinative, my lady. Um, all of these factors, I, I, I would be foolish if I had to say, well, you can decide that any of these factors on their own would amount to, would be sufficient. My, my case is that the nine factors that I outlined, when taken together, give rise to a reasonable expectation of privacy. But the reason why this is important is because in between um, February 2015, when we know that processing began, and September 2015, when the press release came out, the existence of the EAU was not itself a fact known to anybody apart from those in government and probably Mr. McIntyre and anybody who'd read the, uh, the FOIA request. It's not until October of that year that the first reference to the EAU produce is contained in any public document. And that public document is in your bundle. It's called the Counter-Extremism Strategy, which was produced on the 19th of October, 2015. And it's at volume uh, three at page 841. And you will find four references to the Extremism Analysis Unit on page 8E859. This is the first time one finds any reference in a public, publicly uh, published document to the Extremism Analysis Unit. So one sees at the bottom of the page turns to paragraph 42, the third bullet point, last three lines. This will involve particularly close collaboration. Eight with for one page. Page Inside. 659. Sorry, 859. Apart from the press release, I accept it was well, referred to in the press release. Exactly, I was going to say when it was the press yeah, release. Yeah. But, but it's the first time that one finds it referred to in a... Well, it's, it's not the press release, but it's a speech by the then Home Secretary, now Prime Minister, 
25 by 25 the feature analysis, and that then leads to the FOI request from Mr. McIntyre. So it's at B36. Hang on, 23rd of March 2015 is a speech by the Home Secretary. Yes. And that mentions the EAU. Yes. Right. Then that, that then prompts the, the FOI request from Mr. McIntyre. And it's at B36 of the first supplementary bundle. So, so the, the request is at B36. No, no. The speech of the Home Secretary. The speech. B36. Yes. I'm grateful to my learned friend for, for pointing that out. That out. So, so I, I accept that that is that, that in that case is the first time it's mentioned is in that speech. I mean, the first time one sees it referred to. Mr. Mayor, when was the when was the the um, Downing Street press conference? <coughs> September. That was in September. Yes. September. Back in then there's a, then there's a, then there's this document in October 2015, where it's referred to as part of the government's counter extremism strategy. There's four mentions of it on that page. So the first, the first reference to it on that page is on the third bullet point, paragraph 42, the last three lines. <coughs> uh, paragraph 46 on the same page. We have now established the extremism analysis you need to support all government departments and the wider public sector to understand why the extremism issue so they can deal with extremists appropriately. And paragraph 47, over to the page, paragraph 48, the extremism analysis unit will work closely with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and the Department for International Development, recognising that the extremism we see here is often shaped by and connected to extremism elsewhere in the world. So which paragraph is that? That's paragraph 47. <coughs> right, so just trying to work out where's your to get into getting this to. So in October 2015, that's the thing that alerts directly or indirectly. Um, September, when, when the press release comes out. Yeah. Oh, the press release comes out. That, that's, that's the thing. Uh, that's 17th September. That's right. the so first that then alerts um, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. 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 Butt to, um, uh, to the fact that he's viewed by said to be an extremist uh, and he then follows that up and eventually his solicitors ask for um, uh, a subject access make a subject access request you're now moving on to, you then moved on to a different subject which is to say how soon would it have been possible to know about the EAU yes so you so be, now you're going back in time exactly would it have been reasonable for Mr. Butt to have before known before then before September to have known about that exactly uh, 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 because, no, if he, because if he had known about it, I think you're saying, that would be relevant both to 8.1 and 8.2, engagement and breach. Indeed. Well, I'm just trying to Indeed. And yeah. if that would amount to sufficient notice of, of its existence that he, he could have reasonably anticipated that he would be the subject of the investigation. Yeah. And, and my first point is that the EAU's existence was... Uh, was, if not secret, it was certainly, it was certainly uh, there were very few mentions of it um, until September. Um, and uh, the next this point I was right. going to make, the next point I was going to make is that all the documents upon which, all its policy documents were confidential. And indeed they remained confidential until the hearing in, in before Mr. Justice Oosley, when they were, because uh, they were originally disclosed to us on the basis that they re should remain confidential. And during the hearing, the uh, Home Office agreed that they could be published more widely. And those documents uh, are the documents that are attached to the statement of Paul Willis. And I'll, again, I'll just identify them for your, for your Lordship and your Ladyship. There's the draft research policy, which was produced in May 2015. Uh, and you'll find that at uh, page uh, B104. There 
is the uh, social media monitoring policy, which is at B114. While, while you have that um, open. Do you, want, do you want us to go to that, or are you just giving it? Well, I'm just giving you the references in that, because yeah, I was going to come to those reports. Yeah. Uh, and there is the EAU Information Handling Policy at B118. EAU Handling? Handling Policy. Handling. And the EAU Information Sharing Policy at B124. Now, these will become relevant in due course because they set out the policies, the kind of safeguards that one would expect to see uh, set out in you know, a legal document. But these documents weren't published. What was the, what was the occasion of the EAU handling policy? Uh, the EAU information handling policy is B118, and the EAU information sharing policy is at B124. And, my lords, it's, it is... Telling. So where we've got to then, in, in this, as I'm trying to draw together as you're going along, you know, the, the, the principles you're trying to extract from this. So you're saying, uh, here is a body, it's set up, uh, uh, and uh, the date it's set up, nobody knows much about it, it's a public document, um, its policies aren't known um, until a particular period of this Justice Easley. That's right. Uh, you're saying they operate on a basis of confidentiality, uh, and they recognise that um, individual people are going to be disclosed. And all that bears on the, uh, all, all, all bears on the, what I'm doing at the moment is the 8-1 point, I'm still doing yes. the engagement. Yes. On the engagement. Yes, exactly. Have I missed anything else? No, but it's all relevant all right. in due course when we come to 8-2 to as well. So, my Lord, um, what, what what's telling is that the only published documents that the defendant, respondent, relies upon for the purposes of any duty that there may be under data protection legislation to notify of processing, uh, which Mr Justice usually said they were entitled to, to rely upon, um, are documents which contain no reference to the Extremism Analysis Unit or any of its work. And again, I'll give you the, the, the references. You'll see them referred to in his judgment. One is the Home Office Personal Information Charter, which is at B90 of Volume 2. And the other is the Home Office entry on the Information Commissioner's Data Protection Register at B100. And, and my rule I need to draw out of those two documents is that, yes, they are public documents, but there's no mention in any of them of prevent of the extremism analysis unit for extremism. So we respectfully submit that Mr. Buck, Dr. Buck could not reasonably have known about the EAU before the 20th of September when the press release came out, uh, sorry, when the news reports on the basis of the press release came out. Uh, and indeed, it wasn't <coughs> reasonable to have expected him to have made a subject access request any time before uh, his lawyers did in December 2015 make such a subject access request. So I can turn now, my lords, and deal with, I hope, relatively swiftly, having already outlined the key points to the first submission, which is that Mr. Dr. Buck did have a reasonable expectation of privacy. And there are three propositions of law that I wish to make before going back to the eight factors the first proposition is this, that any processing of personal data, particularly of sensitive personal data, by a public authority, to which an individual has not expressly or impliedly consented, and goes, which goes beyond what is a normally foreseeable use of that information. Goes they, beyond what use? A reason, a normally foreseeable. I, I'll, I'll show you which is why I use that phrase in a moment. May create a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, and the 
by the main Archibald Sheep's term up the first authority, which is Uzun in Germany, volume four of the authorities at tab 90. monitor the movements of the of a criminal suspect. And the question arose whether the tracking of his activities or the tracking of his location, which was the only information that the GPS revealed, gave rise to a reasonable expectation of privacy. And the relevant uh, passages start on page 3473 of the bundle page 862 of the report. And you'll see at paragraph 41 the complaint. The applicant's total surveillance via GPS had interfered with his right to respect for private life. Even though the GPS receiver had been built into an object, his car, it had been used to observe his movements and it had enabled the investigating authorities to draw up a comprehensive pattern of his movements in public for months by means of a measure which was very precise and difficult to detect. All his movements had been made known to third persons without his consent, and the information gathered by the GPS surveillance had enabled the authorities to initiate further investigations. Um, and then under the court's assessment, uh, with recapitulation of the relevant principles, uh, paragraph 43 uh, is very familiar. I don't need to read it to your lordships. Um, Paragraph 44, um, there are a number of elements relevant to a consideration of whether a person's private life is concerned by measures affected outside a person's home or private premises. Since there are occasions when people knowingly or intentionally involve themselves in activities which are, are or may be recorded or reported in a public manner, a person's reasonable expectations as to privacy may be a significant, although not necessarily conclusive, factor. A person walking along the street will inevitably be visible to any member of the public who is also present monitoring by technological means of the same public scene, for example, a security guard, is of a similar character. And then this is the uh, important sentence. Private life considerations <coughs> may arise, however, once any systematic or permanent record comes into existence of such material from the public domain. And that's a phrase that one sees in a number of other authorities, and it's in fact the phrase that, that is referred to by the House of Lords and the Supreme Court in the Cat case. And then... This, further elements which the court has taken into account in this respect include the question whether there's been compilation of data on a particular individual, so we stress that. Whether there's been processing or use of personal data, we emphasize that. Or whether there has been publication of the material concerned, and here's the phrase, in a manner or degree beyond that normally foreseeable. Thus, the court has considered that the systematic collection and storing of data by security services on particular individuals, even without the use of covert surveillance, constitutes an interference with these persons' private life. The court has also referred in this context to the Council of Europe's Convention on, of January 28, 1981 for the protection of individuals with regard to automatic processing of personal data, and whose purpose is to secure in the territory of each part of every individual respect for his rights and fundamental freedoms, and in particular his right to privacy with regard to automatic processing of personal data relating to him, such data being defined as any information relating to an identified or identifiable individual. And this is where I, I'll come back to, but the, the idea that as soon as you run data through or, or run an automatic process through a large quantity of data to find information about an individual, that itself is sufficient to turn otherwise what would only be personal data, into um, private information. Or it would be a relevant factor. Uh, 47, the court has further taken into consideration whether the impugned measure amounted to a processing or use of personal data of a nature con to constitute an interference with respect for private life. Thus it considered, for instance, the permanent recording of footage deliberately taken of the applicant at the police station and its use in a video identification procedure as the processing of personal data 
likewise the covert and permanent recording of the applicant's voices at the police station for further analysis. Uh, and then paragraph 48, finally the publication of material obtained in public places in a manner or degree beyond that normally foreseeable may also bring recorded data or material within the scope of Article 81. And I accept that it's, it's only at this stage may bring it within the scope of Article 81. <coughs> and then applying those principles to that case, um, the court stressed that there had been a compilation of data on the applicant, see line four. Um, it rejected the government's argument that this was not the case. Uh, they said, last two lines, the investigating authorities clearly intended to obtain information in the movements <coughs> of both the applicant and his accomplice, as they've been aware from their previous investigations that both suspects have been using S's car. Moreover, the fact that the applicant must, just as S was, be considered to have been the subject of the surveillance by GPS is not in question, because the information on the movements of S's car could only be linked to the applicant by additional visual, visual surveillance. Um, none of the domestic courts had expressed any doubts that he'd been subject to surveillance via GPS. The court further notes that by the surveillance of the applicant via GPS, the investigation authorities for some three months systematically collected and stored data determining in the circumstances the applicant's whereabouts and movements in the public sphere. Just, so just pausing there and coming back to the circumstances in which we're concerned. The systematic collection, that's to say, and systematic in these circumstances means just looking at more than one source and cross-referring that and producing a profile of the places that somebody has visited is sufficient uh, to engage a reasonable expectation of privacy. So if one looks at, if one takes uh, Mr. But, Dr. Butt, and you run a, a search to find out where, he's, wh where his name is mentioned, and you take together all those, those mentions, My lady, what, what the judge, I... The judge in this case <coughs> distinguished. He rejected the notion that there had been systematic monitoring. I did. And, and we, we, we respect this committee because it's wrong to do so. So um, where, uh, where did you say, what, where did you draw the line? Well, I mean, I'm going to take you in a moment to the, uh, the Ripper well, just the question, code. Which is, what, what, how would you define systematic, systematic for this purpose? Obtaining information from more than one source. So observation or recording in any information on more than one occasion. That's what I wrote down before. So I hope that wasn't wrong. That's no, because you could, you, could, you could have somebody sitting down for 12 hours at a time, my lord, and, and obtain an awful lot of information. In fact, you could have somebody sitting down for a few moments and running a program which uh, would monitor and produce a very detailed profile of somebody within microseconds if you use the right tool and indeed if you sit down and you run a Google search uh, on an individual then of course you are able to obtain a significant amount of information about that individual so one Google search could be enough. Well, what I would say is that systematic means looking at more than one source and processing. Yes so what more than one source um, so here uh, the, uh, the Facebook pages of City University for example uh, the tweets, the blog posts on uh, Islam 21C, uh, the drawing together from that information of who had been present and who he had spoken with and who his associates were. And it could, you said it could be a Google search on one page. It could be a Google. I, I, I wouldn't exclude that, my lady. I, mean, I don't need to go that far here. There's no law as a systematic. This is your submission to what it means. Um, I'm going to show you, my lord and my lady, my lord's my lady, in a moment, the, RA, the RIPA guide, code of practice, the, the new code of guidance, which was not in force when Mr. Justice usually looked at this question. And, and it's, in my submission, a very important piece of information um, because it will answer my, lord's, my lady's questions better than I can. Um, but I wanted to show you at this stage uh, what, what the legal basis is for the proposition that it is a question of whether the information is being used in a way that somebody would normally foresee or reasonably foresee. Um, 
And then uh, paragraph 52, in the court's view, GPS surveillance is by its very nature to be distinguished from other methods of visual or acoustic surveillance, which are, as a rule, more susceptible of interfering with a person's right to respect for private life, because they disclose more information on a person's conduct, opinions, or feelings. I'm just pausing there. Uh, in the Uzun case, where the court found that there was an interference, the only information that was being found was where Mr. Uzun had been. If in, the, in, Mr. in Dr. Butt's case, uh, the information that's being found is far more extensive than that, and it relates to where he's been, who he's spoken to, who his associates are, what his religious and political beliefs are. Okay, and so but in fact, you've got to read the thing together. What they're distinguishing is GPS surveillance from visual or acoustic surveillance, which then produces the information category. I accept, I accept that in I that mean, you, context, Otherwise, you, you end with a nonsense, because you say, if, if I watch you walking down the street and I realise who you're talking to, that's surveillance. Well, my lord, it would be. If you were a public body carrying out an investigation and you were there deliberately in order to obtain information, that would amount to surveillance. And that's the point, is that um, that's why my first factor is that the state is carrying out an investigation into relation to something uh, which, to which a stigma attaches, and I will give your, your, your Lordship authority for that in just a moment. Um, my Lords, the, <coughs> the other case where the same uh, proposition may be drawn from, I'm not going to take you to it, it's the Magyar Helsinki case, uh, which is at volume three of the authorities, tab 79, at page 2979 of the bundle, paragraphs 192. 198. And in that case, uh, essentially, the fact that it was open to the uh, to those, well, what was being sought in that case was information uh, relating to uh, uh, public defenders, public those doing publicly. Um, well, perhaps if we go there, it's probably easiest. It's um, it's volume three. <coughs> Tab 79, page 2979. This, is, this was a curious case because, in fact, um, the, the applicant, which was a, which was a human rights um, NGO, <laughs> sought to obtain from the Hungarian authorities information about... Uh, individuals who acted in publicly funded cases uh, and seeking a limited amount of information about it, namely how many cases they had done, <coughs> how many publicly funded cases they had done. And the Hungarian authorities refused to disclose that information, asserting that if they were to have disclosed that information, it would have amounted to uh, an interference with uh, the individual's private lives. And in this case, the Strasbourg court looked at that question. Would it have amounted to an interference with the human rights, the, the right to privacy of those, uh, of those public defenders? And if one starts at page uh, 2979, paragraph 193. In determining whether the personal information retained by the authorities related to the relevant public defenders enjoyment of their right to respect for private life, the court will have due regard to the specific context. There are a number of elements which are relevant to the assessment of whether a person's private life is concerned by measures affected outside that person's home or private premises. Since there are occasions when people knowingly or intentionally involve themselves in activities which are or may be recorded or reported in a public manner, a person's <coughs> reasonable expectation as to privacy may be a significant, although not necessarily conclusive factor in the assessment. In paragraph 194, uh, to pick it up in the third line, for the court, the request for these names, although they constituted personal data, related predominantly to the conduct of professional activities in the context of public proceedings. In this sense, public defenders' professional activities cannot, consider, cannot be considered to be a private matter. So that was one reason why uh, they conclude in, in due course that it's not, uh, it doesn't give rise to a reasonable expectation of privacy. And then 195, the court also finds that the disclosure of public defenders' names in a number of their respective appointments would not have subjected them to a degree of, to, to exposure to a degree surpassing that which they could possibly have foreseen when registering as 
public defender. So there again, one has the foreseeability point. It's phrased in a slightly different way. Um, although in that particular case, the, the key reason why the court found that there was um, uh, no reasonable expectation of privacy is that page, paragraph 198 and page 2981, the last four lines, as already mentioned above, it consisted only of information of a statistical nature about the number of times the individuals in question had been appointed to represent defendants in public criminal proceedings within the framework of a publicly funded national legal entity. So taking those factors together, public activity, purely statistical information, but also that the public defenders could have foreseen that that information might be used in that way at the time that they were provided. Um, <coughs> and we accept that uh, if an individual is notice, notified of the use that's been made of his otherwise private information and given an opportunity to challenge it, then there's no reasonable expectation of privacy. And I mentioned the case of W, which your lordships will find, uh, volume 3, tab 65. this case earlier, this is a case where um, the fact that an individual had received medical treatment uh, which they were obliged to pay could be um, disclosed to another government department in order to recover the costs of that, uh, that treatment, this is for foreign nationals, and the question was whether the disclosure of that information gave rise to a, <coughs> an interference. In paragraph 43, uh, the Court of Appeal, um, the then Lord Master of the Royal Dyson, said this, we must, however, now deal with the judge's third reason for holding there's no reasonable expectation of privacy. Prior to August 2014, the guidance said that the information could not be shared unless the patient had been informed. As we've seen, the updated version doesn't include a prohibition, but paragraph 9 of this version makes it clear that while it's not necessary to seek the patient's consent before sharing their personal information, it's best practice to inform the patient that you've done so or are going to do so, and why. We do not consider that the fact that informing the patient is now only described as best practice is material. The patient liable for charges will reasonably expect that in the event of default, steps will be taken to enforce payment, which may include, include informing others of the fact, duration and cost of his stay at the hospital concerned, and that to this extent their stay at the hospital will not necessarily be kept confidential. Ms. Proof submits that the fact that patients are made aware the information may be transmitted does not of itself mean that the data are not private or confidential. We disagree. The Supreme Court decision in Reed J.R. 38 confirms what was said in cases such as Murray, that the question whether there is a reasonable expectation of privacy is a broad one which takes account of all the circumstances of the case. We do not see how overseas visitors who, before they're treated, are made aware of the fact that if they incur charges in excess of £1,000 and pay them within three months, the information may be passed to the Secretary of State for on the transmission. The State of Immigration purpose can have any, to less, any reasonable expectation that the information will not be transmitted in precisely that way. They will, however, have a reasonable expectation of privacy in relation to the information vis-à-vis -vis anyone else. So, if you're told, you don't have a reasonable expectation. If you're not told, then it, dif then it turns on this question of whether the use is one that you can normally or reasonably foresee. So that's the, that's the principle. Well, in, in this case, so far as the assessment that was carried out and the search that was carried out in order to answer the MP's question. Well, it was reasonably foreseeable there would be an investigation of the evidence relating to it. Well, uh, that's why I've been at pains, my Lord, to, to focus on what happened before the press release. Because no, I, I, accept, I, 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 I accept that there's two different... That, but, uh, but, but, but would you accept that? It seems to me at the moment that, that it's difficult to say that there's any reasonable expectation that there wouldn't be an investigation at that point in order to answer that question as to what material was publicly available. Well, I think, I think what one could say would be reasonably foreseeable at that stage was that the EAU would be asked for the information that they had, not that the EAU would then carry out a further investigation, because, of course, the decision... Is that, is that, is that realistic? I mean, I look at the question. But if the question was, what material is there? What material is there to suppose that, 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 that this uh, uh, 
that he is a person who's an extremist, that the government would, would, would do a general search. And is that it was, it was based, the question, if I can, um, if, I'm, if I'm right, was what, on, what was the basis on which you formed that assessment? Not what information can you now go out and find which will support that assessment. So in, in that Didn't context, matter. we accept that handing over the information that they've already got would have been a reasonably foreseeable uh, processing of that data. Going off and carrying out a further investigation to try and find further evidence because they might have been concerned <laughs> that there wasn't enough uh, would not be reasonably foreseeable. That would be my submission. Um, I said that there were um, three propositions. The second proposition is that there are limits, nevertheless, to the extent to which a person can be said to have consented to or foreseen the use of private information. That's based upon the uh, recent Strasbourg case of Barbalescu, uh, which your lordships will find at volume 5, at tab uh, 106. Just while we turn that up, Mr. Bain, just I'm troubled, as, as often in these cases, by the fact that principles are extracted, which are said to apply across the board from such terribly widely different contexts. Yes. Um, and one has to be very careful before saying, well, the expression of views in the case to do with public defenders' use of their time and whether legal aid is, a, is applied comes across to this sort of term. Well, well, so I, 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 accept, I, I accept that we can only work with the material that we had. We, we searched to, to draw principles from as broad a range of cases as possible no. uh, in order to demonstrate that there's a principle that applies in, in all cases. But what I accept is that these are factors. They are not in and of themselves the answer in any, uh, in any one case. because uh, And there's a degree of judgment that needs to be um, exercised. Barbalescu um, is, a context, is a case in which the, the context was the, the applicant had in fact been monitored, his, his emails had been monitored, and his internet usage had been monitored and read by his employer in circumstances where his employer had told him in advance that he was prohibited to use his emails and his internet for any private use. And the question arose was whether in those circumstances uh, it can be said he had a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, if one picks it up at paragraph uh, um, 69, uh, one finds the beginning of the court's assessment, and it runs through to paragraph 81. I won't take you to all of the passages, but if you could just see that the question... Um, Paragraph 69. The question arising in the present case is whether the matters complained of by the applicant fall within the scope of Article 8. Um, paragraph 7 of the familiar uh, passage. Um, paragraph 71. Uh, the court considers that the notion of private life may include professional activities or activities taking place in a public context. Restrictions on an individual's professional life may fall within Article 8, whether repercussions on the manner in which he or she constructs his or her social identity by developing relationships with others it should be noted in this connection that it's in the course of their working life <coughs> that the majority of people have a significant and not the greatest opportunity to develop relationships with the outside world. And then 73, it's clear from the court's case law that communications from business premises as well as from the home may be covered by the notions of private life and correspondence from the meaning of Article 8. See Halford and Cotton. In order to ascertain whether the notions of private life and correspondence are applicable, the court has on several occasions examined whether individuals had a reasonable expectation of privacy. In that context, it is stated that a reasonable expectation of privacy is significant, though not necessarily a conclusive factor. And then if we could pick it up at paragraph 78. Um, in any event, it does not appear that the applicant was informed in advance of the extent and nature of his employer's monitoring activities or of the possibility that the employer might have access to the actual contents of his communications. And then pick that up again at paragraph 80. It's open to question whether, and if so, to what extent, the employer's restrictive regulations left the applicant with a reasonable expectation of privacy. Be that as it may, an employer's instructions cannot reduce private social life in the workplace to zero. 
respect for private life and for the privacy of correspondence continues to exist, even if these may be restricted insofar as necessary. In other words, what we draw from this are two propositions. The first one is that the extent to which a person has been notified that their um, that information is being processed is a significant factor in deciding whether there is a reasonable expectation of privacy. The second proposition is, that, is this, that it may be that there's no reasonable expectation of privacy, but nevertheless, Article 8 may be engaged. Now, I am not seeking your Lordship's ruling on that point because I accept you're bound by the Supreme Court in JR 38, where the Supreme Court held by a majority that a reasonable expectation of privacy was a necessary factor in deciding whether Article 8 was engaged. But we respectfully submit that it may not be the end of the question. It may, it may not be the end of the question. And one gets that um, as well from the dissenting uh, judgments, sorry, yes, the, the judgment of the six dissenting judgments. I won't take you to the passages, um, but you'll find them in the same case from page 4330. Is it JR 38? No, no, sorry, the dissenting judgment in Barbalesque. Oh, sure. Paragraphs 1 and 19 to 20. I won't, I won't ask your lordships to go there now. Um, but they make clear that they, they were even more sure that there was no reasonable expectation of privacy, but they accepted that Article 8 was engaged. But for our purposes... Um, and that was in the context of not looking at that, but an employer looking at private correspondence. Indeed. Um, in a, um, which was engaged in, which also had protected, in a, in a work setting. Oh, uh, yes. And the, the point is, is that, is that, that, that they very restrictively uh, look, look very restrictively at the question of whether he had been given adequate notice, um, which is the point that I that I'm seeking to draw from them. But they then went on to also say that even if he had been given adequate notice, even if he didn't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, um, Article Eight was still engaged in the particular circumstances of that case. I accept that. But, but I'm not asking your lordships to, to resolve that point in any event, because that is uh, not something that you can uh, you can determine uh, given the Supreme Court's decision in JR 38. Right. So in, in Barbalesky, the court what said that he did not have he he did whether, not have said whether he had a, that he, that he did not have sufficient notification of his uh, personal actions. That's right. Process. That's right. And the and the dissenting judges. One of the reasons for their dissent was that, well, in fact, as far as they were concerned, he clearly did have sufficient notification, uh, but they accepted that his Article 8 rights were engaged. What the majority said was he wasn't given sufficient notification, but even if he, whether or not he had a reasonable expectation of privacy, uh, his Article 8 rights were engaged. And so I rely on the first of those propositions, but not the second, because, as I said, I accept. He was dealing with the applicant. I accept that. I accept that. But but it's the the, the point is, like I said, my lady, I don't need to I don't need to go any further on this point because we're about your your lordships are bound by JR thirty eight that reasonable expectation is the touchstone, and that's what I'm. But that's it's what important I'm when, when we look at JR thirty eight. I don't know whether you want to take us to it, but the court there are the various passages where the court equates legitimate expectation with reasonable expectation. Uh, and it does seem that we have to keep in mind it's not just a subjective view. Um, it may be rendered legitimate or otherwise by notice. But it's not a question of what the person might feel reasonably within the range of reasonable responses. It's an objective test. And somehow, sometimes it can be helpful sorting one context from another to ask the question, is this a legitimate expectation? And that emphasizes the objective context. As in this case, yeah, I, where... I, I, would, I, I wouldn't say that it's entirely subjective. I, yeah. I, I accept that. Um, and, and therefore, um, you know, the question is, you, you need to look at it in all the circumstances, would a reasonable person in that individual situation yeah. have a reasonable expectation of privacy? So you have to look at their specific circumstances and put yourself in their shoes before you apply the 
the test of right, what so is a reasonable or normal law. Or right, so again, for my purpose, we're trying to extract where we are and relate it to the principle. I, I think where we're getting to now is you're saying, well, until September 2015, uh, there was no notification, sufficient notification, to Mr. Bowden that his uh, details about what he'd done, whether it's public or not, was going to be processed and retained. That, uh, and you're relying upon Barbulescu, as, uh, um, in particular, as support that that's a material consideration. No, that's where we get. That's where we get into. That's, that's what we're so although there, although there was indeed information beforehand uh, from earlier on about the setting up uh, of uh, uh, the EAU, um, and it didn't say anything about extremism. It wouldn't have given him or anybody else in his position a reasonable expectation that material would be um, would be retained and, uh, and analysed. That, that's what this all comes to. Yes. Uh, now, well, I, I, I outlined nine factors uh, earlier in my submissions that, that I submitted were all uses of information that, that, to which a reasonable expectation of privacy would attach, um, which the courts have to date accepted, therefore are not uses of material that one could consider to be normally foreseeable. And the first one I mentioned was the, f the very fact that an investigation is being carried out by a public authority that carries a stigma. And for that proposition, I rely upon the recent decision uh, in uh, the, the Cliff Richard case, the Cliff Richard against BBC. Um, it's volume six, tab 116. Uh, and it's paragraphs 248 to 252. Um, would your lordship mind if I don't take you to it? Uh, just give you the, 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 the reference, because we're going to run out of time. Uh, um, All right, you don't take to it, but I just want to put it tab. Yeah, it's, it's tab. It's tab 116. Which okay. paragraphs? Are you paragraphs 248 to 252. And the, the proposition, my lord, is this, that the, the court accepted the very fact that Mr Richards was the subject of a police investigation, which carried with it a serious stigma, was sufficient to engage his Article 8 rights and a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, uh, and we submit that this is analogous to the situation where the security services are investigating whether somebody is a subversive or a communist sympathiser, as in the Hewitt and Harmon case. And I'll give you Lordship to the reference without taking you to it. Volume 6, tab 118, paragraphs 24 to 27. And my lords, that's one of the reasons why, to distinguish some of the examples that my learned friend gives as to why uh, there can be no reasonable expectation of privacy, he gave the example of, a, of the Department for Culture, Media and Sport holding a database of actors um, and <coughs> suggesting that a database of British actors, authors and sports people in their plays, films or books um, would therefore engage a reasonable expectation of privacy. And I would respectfully suggest that it wouldn't 